Vivek Ramaswamy stands ready to upend the Republican primary. I do think it takes an outsider. People here are hungry for outsiders. You can see it in his eyes that he truly cares for the nation. I am the youngest person ever to run for the GOP nomination for U.S. president. At 38, he possesses the confidence of a seasoned politician. And I love seeing young people here. Thomas Jefferson was 30 years old when he wrote the Declaration of Independence. It takes a person of a different generation to reach the next generation. Now, Ramaswamy must convince voters youth and optimism outweighs age and experience. Good evening from Chicago and welcome to the Vivek Ramaswamy Town Hall on News Nation. I'm Leland Vitter, and tonight voters will get to ask the entrepreneur turn presidential candidate about the issues that matter most to them, rather than the hot questions of inside the Washington Beltway. In addition to you at home, we are joined by live studio audiences at St. Anselm College in New Hampshire and Grandview University in Des Moines, Iowa, along with the folks here in Chicago. The audience members have agreed to keep their reactions to a minimum so we can get to more of the questions. Except for right now, when we welcome what would be the youngest party nominee in American history, Mr. Vivek Ramaswamy. Thank you. Welcome. Good to see you. Welcome Good back to Iowa. Good to be here, guys. Thank you. Some polls of Republican voters show Ramaswamy in third place behind former President Donald Trump and Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. We encourage you at home to share your thoughts on social media. You can use the hashtag Vivek Town Hall. Mr. Ramaswamy agreed to this evening's event without preconditions and without seeing the questions or picking the audience members. News Nation recruited open-minded voters interested in hearing Mr. Ramaswamy's ideas. So now our first questions are actually to the audience. By a show of hands, how many of you plan to vote or caucus in the Republican primary. All right, almost everybody. Of you, how many of you have an open mind about who you will vote for? All right, roughly the same number. You got some work to do here tonight. That's right. And we start with breaking news, quite literally in the past 30 seconds. <laughs> A grand jury in Georgia has indicted President Trump, the fourth indictment for him in the last five months. This relates, as you know, to his attempts to overturn the election in Georgia. Obviously, breaking news. Uh, we'll get to a lot more with Donald Trump in a minute, but I would just want to hear your thoughts. Well, being that it came down in the last 30 seconds, I haven't had a chance to read the indictment no. yet. But I do think we have to evaluate this indictment in the context of the three that preceded it in the last four months, one in the state of New York for unprecedented charges, novel legal theories used to charge in the documents case, in the what was it January 6th case, now moved to a different standard of crime. The reality is this. These are politicized persecutions through prosecution. And I say this as somebody who's running in some polls third and some polls like today second. It would be a lot easier for me if Donald Trump were not in this primary. But that is not how I want to win this election. The way we do elections in the United States of America is that we, the people, you all, get to decide who governs, not the federal police state. And I do not want to see us become, Leland, some banana republic where the party in power, whoever that party is, use police force to indict its political opponents in the middle of an election on unprecedented and untested legal theories, that is wrong. And I stand not on the side of self-interest, but on the side of principle when I say that. All right. You and I know from being in Iowa and you from the campaign trail, us from covering it, uh, the voters are interested in a lot of things. Donald Trump is not something that they often bring up, yep. at least as we've talked to them. So we will get more on that later and move on to some of our questions. Denise Williams from suburban Chicago. Her son, private first class Andrew Meary, was 21 years old when he was killed in combat in Afghanistan back in 2010. 
Uh, Denise, first of all, thank you for being here. And we think about your son and what he was, the sacrifice he made for our country. Uh, what is your question for Mr. Ramaswamy? Thank you for having me and thank you for your kind words. So, Mr. Ramaswamy, given your lack of national security experience, how would you address the increasing aggressive actions towards our naval ships and pilots in the Pacific by the Chinese and the Russians? Well, thank you for that question, Denise. And the first thing I also want to say is I thank your son for his service and I'm sorry for your loss. My hallmark as U.S. president is to make sure, I'm saying this as the parent of two sons myself, that we will not send our sons and daughters to die in wars that do not advance American interests. That is going to be a solid principle for me in leading this country. If we're going to use our military, it is going to be to defend the interests of Americans here on American soil. As it relates to the South Pacific, the question you asked about, we do have a vital interest at stake in making sure that China does not control the global semiconductor supply chain in Taiwan. We depend on that supply chain for our entire modern way of life, from those shoes in our feet to the, even the phones in our pockets, to these lights in this room being powered by leading edge advanced semiconductors. So one of the things that I have said is that until we have achieved semiconductor independence, we will ensure that Taiwan is not invaded by China. We will do whatever is necessary to deter China from invading Taiwan. I will end the Ukraine war on terms that pull Russia out of its alliance with China. We will upgrade our alliance with India to make sure they're on side as well, turn Taiwan into a porcupine, and yes, move more of our naval assets, run a destroyer through the Taiwan Strait every month if that's what's necessary. But after that, our commitments will change. And if we move from strategic ambiguity to strategic clarity, then China knows it will not be in their self-interest to aggress on Taiwan until we have achieved true independence. And after that, I'm not going to send our sons and daughters to die to fight somebody else's civil war. But until then, that is a vital national security interest. Okay. And I do think it takes an outsider to be able to see it that way. All right, a couple of quick things. You said to fight someone else's civil war. That would be a major change in American policy to declare that a civil war would be the way to figure out the Taiwan issue, number one. Number two, you said to deter Chinese aggression. Does that mean that you would categorically say American forces would defend Taiwan? My message to Xi Jinping is you do not mess with the United States of America and you do not mess with our interests. And our interests include Taiwan until we have achieved semiconductor independence. So yes, I will be very clear that we are fully prepared to actually see that through, that we will move for two Ohio class SSGNs to the South to the South China Sea, as well as to the Pacific. We will move destroyers through the Taiwan Strait. We will enter our alliance with India. We will pull Russia out of its military alliance with China by ending the Ukraine war. This is how we deter them. But after 2028, after the end of my first term, we will be in a position to say our commitments will be different. Xi Jinping will not go for Taiwan until the end of my first term. I'm confident of that. And that is how we secure American interests while avoiding nuclear war, I do think that this will be the most important element of our foreign policy for whoever's the next president. And I think the strategic clarity that I'm offering is actually more likely to secure peace than the position of strategic ambiguity that the U.S. has so far adopted. All right, we'll move on to Victor Roddinghouse in Iowa. He's a truck driver and a veteran of the U.S. military joining us from Des Moines. Go ahead. Hey, Mr. Ramaswamy. With all the division, we would like to know who are your top cabinet picks that you would choose to seek advice and counsel from? All right, I, I, I think I'll clarify just a little yep. bit in that it's early, right, yes. in this process. So it may not be early yet to, and fair yet to make you pick an actual cabinet as of now with names. But if we, if we zoom out a little bit, give us some names of either Donald Trump's cabinet, Joe Biden's cabinet, Barack Obama's cabinet, even George W. Bush's cabinet that are of the type of people you would look for? So look, it, when it comes to foreign policy, I believe in Cold War realists as the kind of school of thought that I want to see. Not people who favor the model of liberal hegemony, not neoconservatives, but the likes of George Kennan, of, who of course has long passed, or James Baker, 
that gives you the sense of the kind of foreign policy vision that I want to bring to the table. Realism. Nations advancing their own self-interest. I think that's what we're missing in our foreign policy establishment today. When it comes to somebody who wants to lead the U.S. Federal Reserve, for example, a really important pick that the next president will have to make in January of 2026, I like the likes of Rand Paul or Ron Paul, who have a vision that I share for radical reform of the U.S. Federal Reserve, restoring dollar stability as a single mandate. But in any case, whoever it is in a cabinet position, it is going to have to be somebody who shares my commitment to an originalist understanding of the Constitution. And Leland, one of the things we've already done that no other campaign has done is we've released our list of federal judges and Supreme Court picks. That's something that's actually provided greater transparency for how I see the Constitution. And I think it's also going to have to be cabinet members and other federal employees who are committed to my vision to reduce the federal employee headcount by 75% by the end of my first term, 50% by the end of the first year. So these are going to have to be agency heads who are, yes, willing, ready, able, and even have the energy to actually fire potentially a majority of the people reporting into them. That is how we restore integrity in our constitutional republic. All right. So I, I got James Baker and I got yes. Ron Rand Paul. Any other former cabinet members, any other current cabinet members that you'd be willing to say this is the kind of pe person I'm looking for? Well, look, we're sitting here in August before the first debate, still five months in advance of the first primary. Many of them could even be other people who are running in this race for U.S. president. I'm looking forward to that debate stage. I'll be keeping an eye and okay. remembering well, well, so they, who's actually doing next best to see if actually they might actually occupy a pretty good cabinet role. I think there are good governors in this, in this you know, a lot of good Republican governors from Brian Kemp to Kim Reynolds to Kevin Stitt to Christy Nome. I mean, the list goes on. So I think we have a okay. deep bench to choose from. But that bench of red state governors will be one of the places that I look for my cabinet as well. All right. So that's where the team of rivals comes from. Yes. If it, if it would be. Anybody who's on the debate stage that you're going to be with that you think could make up part of that team of rivals? Look, I actually think pretty highly of most of my, I don't want to call them competitors. I'll call them colleagues who are on that debate stage. You don't hear me bashing other candidates because I'm going to need each of them to play their role when it comes to reviving this nation. And so, yes, I do think that this presidential campaign will put some of them to the test. I think a certain number of them will be eligible for cabinet positions in my administration. I also want to say a word about Trump. I think Trump was an excellent president. I think his defeat of Hillary Clinton in 2016 was an important political event that stopped the leftward march through our government and our institutions. And so I expect to take him as an advisor as well, as I'm actually taking to the next level our America First agenda, shutting down that administrative state. There were some forces that stopped him that I expect will not stop me, but I will be proud to still learn from the foundation that he laid and even understand what he would have done differently. So that's the way I think about my fellow competitors in this race. There are people who I will rely on in different ways from the White House as I lead this nation forward. This is not a one-man job. This is a team sport. That's the way I see it. All right, we'll get back a little later to how you'd shut down the administrative state. Meantime, uh, Deval Patel, who's a financial consultant here in Chicago, with us now. Great. Uh, thank you for being here. Welcome back to Chicago. Uh, so regardless of who you voted for, it's not a secret that 2016-2020, highly divisive for the country. Uh, behind closed doors, when I speak to my more left-leaning friends, uh, it's clear that we all want the same things. We might disagree on policy of, of how to get to the outcome, but it's, it's very clear that everyone's pretty much on the same page. Uh, so what is your value proposition, regardless of party standing, on how you're going to unite the country and especially convince, let's say, folks in Chicago who have largely voted a certain way for most of their lives on why you are the right candidate to unite the country regardless of policy? Deval, thank you. That's such an important question. We're skating on thin ice as a country now. I do not want to see us march to some national divorce. I want to lead us to a national revival. The first and most important catalyst to do that is a landslide election in 2024. This cannot be another 50.1 election. It just can't. I think that is risky for the country. It may take some of that ice and actually run some cracks through it that I do not want to see happen. I think I am the only candidate in the Republican field who can actually deliver that landslide because we are bringing young people with us in droves. I'm the youngest person ever to run for U.S. president in the Republican Party. 
I have lived the American dream. This country has given me much. If it's son of immigrants who came to this country with no money, I've gone on to found multi-billion dollar companies, did it while marrying my wife, raising our two sons. That's the example we want to set for this country of what is possible, regardless of whether you're black or white, regardless of whether you are Democrat or Republican. That's the way it's done in the United States of America. That is what unites us. And I think the way we get to national unity, actually, from the White House, isn't just through policy. Because we're going to disagree on a wide range of contentious policies. But I think half the role of U.S. president is setting a tone of national character, of being a president in the White House. And I think it's been a long time since we've had one who meets this high standard, where I can look my two sons in the eye and tell them in good conscience that whether or not I agree with his policies, at least I want you to grow up and be like him. I think that's an important part of how the next president can actually reunite this country. That's the standard I want you to hold me to when I'm in that position if you all put me there. Thank you. Is that going to work for your friends, you think? Ah, you know, we're still a year away, <laughs> but I think uh, we're, we're on our way there. One um, more thing I want to add, and, to, and you can share this with your friends too, for, for what it's worth, is some people think, good people, even in the Republican Party, believe the way we get to national unity is through compromise. I actually see it differently. I think the way we get to national unity is by being uncompromising about the principles that actually make us American. The pursuit of excellence, meritocracy, free speech, the rule of law, self-governance over aristocracy. If we're being honest, those are extreme ideals. Those are radical ideals. But that's what makes America itself. And our strength in our country is not our diversity. In some ways, we have gotten so obsessed with celebrating our diversity and our differences so much that we forgot all of the ways we are really just the same as Americans, bound by a common creed. E pluribus unum means from many one. That's actually what we're going to have to revive, that which unites us across our diversity. That's our true strength. Great answer. Thank you. Thank you. you. You mentioned your faith, which has become an issue on the campaign trail. Yes. In fact, a, a Democratic congressman, prominent Democratic congressman, came to your defense when you were attacked by a bigoted MAGA pastor over your Hindu, Hindu faith. We just came from Iowa. They have a history of electing and choosing in their caucuses conservative Christians, mm -hmm. right? Pat Robertson, Mike Huckabee, yep. Rick Santorum, the list, goes, the list goes on. Faith has become an issue in presidential politics, right? We've got... Uh, Obama and Reverend Wright, Mitt Romney, Mormonism, mm -hmm. John Kennedy and his, his Catholic faith. Is your faith fair game in this election? You know what? I'm going to be very honest. Everything is fair game to ask about in this election. We have to build trust with the public. And so the way I'm running this campaign is nothing's off limits. I'm asking you to put me in the seat of leading this country forward. My job in this election is for you to know, the voters to know, who I am and what I stand for. If the voters want what I'm putting up, and I'll be their next president. And if not, I will put my head on my pillow at night knowing that at least I did my part. So am I religious? Yes, I am. I'm Hindu. I'm not Christian. And we are a nation founded on Judeo-Christian values. But here's what I can say with confidence. I share those same values in common. I believe I live by those values more so than many self-proclaimed Christian politicians. And I think that I stand for religious liberty with such ardence that in many ways, I'm going to be a better protector of religious liberties than many of the Christian right politicians, or else we wouldn't see the assault on religious liberties that we see today. And the best part is, nobody is gonna accuse me of being a Christian nationalist as I do it. <laughs> and so a big part of my job is to make concepts like faith and family and patriotism cool again for the next generation. I'm a member of a different generation. I want to use that to our advantage to pass on those ideals to the next generation. That's an opportunity. And yes, it might take somebody who's just a little bit different to revive that which we lack. And the real divide in this country as I see it, uh, even on the front of religion, is not between those who are members of different traditional religions from Judaism to Christianity to Hinduism to otherwise. It is actually between those who have adopted traditional religion and those who pledge allegiance to a new religion of secularism. 
wokeism, transgenderism, climatism, COVIDism. These are new secular religions that have become a substitute for traditional religion. And I think the most dangerous religions of all, Leland, are those where the practitioners refuse to admit that they're actually part of a religion. That's not a religion, that's a cult. That's how you get to a modern climate movement or a modern woke movement that does not make sense on its own terms. And so, yes, I will always tell you who I am. I'll never pretend to be something that I'm not. But I think that honesty is something that voters, including voters in Iowa, will reward. And I am going to say that, yes, are there going to be some people who make some fringe comments? Do those comments from that one MAGA pastor, as was the self-described descriptor, representative of the Christian right? The answer is, in my book, no, it is not. Okay, I went to a church in Iowa this last Sunday, and I went to one the past Sunday, too. I went to Catholic schools. I probably read the Bible more closely than many Christians that I know. And I can tell you deeply that we share that same value set. And for a guy who's not running for pastor-in-chief but commander-in-chief, that's really what matters. All right. We're going to get to values here uh, in a minute. When we come back, the drastic measures Mr. Ramaswamy proposes in the battle over values between parents and school districts. And we'll get some questions from our audiences in the first two states to decide the Republican primary. You remember that? We were I there together in Iowa? I know that guy. All right, there we go. Yeah, well, we know that woman, too. A poor yes. Ramaswamy, your wife there, wonderful woman. Yes. We we're really glad to be able to spend a little bit of time with her. We spent Saturday with the Ramaswamis in Iowa, and she's not alone in caring about her children's future. You talk about that an awful lot on the campaign trail. And as we put together tonight in the questions and started interviewing audience members, the amount of questions we got focusing on education stunned us. Hmm. As you could argue it was the number one issue people cared about. It's an issue you talk a yes. lot about in, in totality. Uh, you've made abolishing the Department of Education a key part of your campaign. We'll get to how you're going to do that in a minute. Brian, Iowa, is going to ask about that. Karen in New Hampshire wants to ask about your proposed civics test for high school seniors. But we actually start from a question from Anna Lester. She's a 17-year-old high school senior here in Illinois. Uh, by no measure, either the 25-year-old rule or the 18-year-old rule. Will you be 18 for the election? You can vote? I will. Yeah, I will. All right. There you go. Here's your question. Okay. Yeah. As you mentioned, I'm 17 years old, and I'm a senior in high school. And um, I've found that over the past few years, especially since the pandemic, it's been extremely difficult to voice any conservative opinion without pushback from teachers and peers. Um, and I don't see an equal attitude towards students who share more progressive opinions. I'm a young person, and I know that a lot of people are in my shoes, and they're too scared to share their opinions because of their fear of being labeled or being discriminated against. And my question is, how would you plan to implement policies that protect and encourage free speech among young people like myself? Well, it's a great question. And first of all, I'm so grateful as a young person that you are here and as engaged as you are. And I can basically confirm that I see everything you say amongst young people. My wife, Apoorva, and I, who's, she's also a, hopefully a hero that stands as an example for what's possible in this country, we made a decision to endow a scholarship called the American Identity Scholarship. It's one of the most rewarding, financially rewarding scholarships that a high school senior can win. It's $25,000 towards college. We're now hearing some high schools, including those that have imposed racial equity agendas on their students, say they will not even inform their students of that scholarship that they could win because they deem the American Identity Scholarship to be controversial. This shows how far we've come as a culture. So I feel what you do. I'll say some things that I'm going to bring to the table, but it's not just going to be me that solves this problem. It's going to be you. That being said, there are things that the government should do. I think that much of what we call wokeism, it meets the Supreme Court's test for what counts as a religion. Well, if it really meets the Supreme Court's test, then that means much of what we see, even in public school teacher training, constitutes a Title VII violation. The Title VII violation is that the prohibition on discrimination on the basis of religion says you can't force somebody to bow down to the religion of the employer, especially when that employer is the federal government or the state government. 
Well, in this case, if this meets the Supreme Court's test for what counts as a religion, certain words you can't say, clothes you can't wear, apologies you must recite, well, then that means that bending the knee to this religion is no more legal than forcing it for any other. So I will instruct the Department of Justice to enforce our civil rights laws even-handedly, to eliminate the political viewpoint discrimination that we see in the private sector. That's just one of many examples of things that I plan to do as your next president. But I also want to be very clear. The president is not going to be a political messiah to solve all of our cultural problems. Some of that's going to land on your footstep as well. I'll remind you that Alexander Hamilton was in his early 20s when we declared independence. Thomas Jefferson was 33 when he wrote the Declaration of Independence. People say, I'm young at 38. I'm old compared to those guys running for U.S. president. So I think it will be young people who bear both the responsibility and have the opportunity to step up and be those revolutionaries in our time. What does that mean? When you are the only person in the room, whatever that room is, maybe it's in college next year, Maybe it's at the dinner table. Maybe it's when you, with your friends in a car ride. When you're the only person in a room who believes what you do, you have an obligation now more than ever to actually stand up and say it. And I will make you a promise. You hold my feet to this fire if I don't keep this promise to you. If you do that and you do it with conviction, you will find that you are not the only person in that room who believed what you did because other people will come out of their closet as well. Fear has been infectious, you're right. But courage can be contagious too. So I will do my part, but I need you to do yours. And that is how we're gonna revive this country. Thank you so much. And thank you. I promise to do that. Thank you. You have my promise too. I'm very proud of you. Thank, thank you. you. All right, uh, Dr. Brian McQuaid, I think you earned yourself a new supporter if she wasn't already. She was Dr. Excellent. Brian McQuaid, associate professor at Grand Beer U University in Iowa is with us, professor. Uh, America has long uh, been a global leader in higher education. You know, we produce some of the greatest scientists, doctors, lawyers, uh, scientists uh, for generations. Uh, today, higher education is in crisis. Uh, the public is questioning the value of higher education. Uh, we're talking a lot about student loans and student loan debt. Uh, what, you know, your campaign has really been about revival and about doing things differently. What will your uh, higher education policy be to do things differently uh, and to restore American leadership in higher education uh, for the next generation, you know, for our kids, so that they have a hope of uh, education in the future? Great question, thank you. I, I think that this goes back to the question of what is the American dream? To me, the American dream is a system of meritocracy where anybody, whoever you are, regardless of your skin color or where your parents came from, you can achieve the maximum of your God-given potential. Whatever that potential is, in a diverse area it may be, nobody's gonna stop you on that way. So for me, that American dream ran through four-year college education. But for other students, it may run through a one-year vocational program to be a welder or a mechanic or a carpenter or a builder. The problem today is we have a U.S. Department of Education and a federal government that artificially distorts the choices that students make. By subsidizing four-year college degrees and saddling students with debt, while many of those students would have been better off going to a one-year vocational program instead. That same Federal Department of Education is also wasting dollars that could be actually in the hands of parents to deliver their children better K through 12 education. So in a nutshell, here's what I'm gonna do as president. I will shut down the US Department of Education. I will use that $80 billion and put it in the hands of parents across this country to send their kids to the best possible K through 12 schools that they can. I'll go further and make sure that we do this on terms that require localities to eliminate teachers unions so that public schools can actually go once again compete with private schools and charter schools. If you're gonna teach it in the classroom, you better put it online. If you don't wanna put it online, you probably shouldn't be teaching it in the classroom and revive civic education in this country. That puts students in a better position when they then graduate from 12th grade to make that best choice for themselves. And for those who do choose four-year college education, it is a fact that costs have skyrocketed and ballooned out of control. It is inexcusable. And it is in direct correlation to hiring people in the managerial class, not even professors, associate deans of diversity or God knows what, in the Michigan system, 
10 times proliferation of that cancer compared to either professors or students. That is wrong. And the way we actually cut cost is to first cut the bureaucracy, both in the federal government and even in those public universities that have hired the bureaucratic rot as well. So there's a lot more to say. It's a great question, but that at least gives you a taste of how I'll turn education back to being about the achievement of students rather than about employment opportunities for members of the bureaucratic class. I think we can all reasonably agree there's a lot of different policy proposals wrapped up in yes. that answer. Uh, eliminating the Department of Education is something you've talked a lot about. Two ways to do that. Ronald Reagan promised to do it as well after Jimmy yep. Carter started it. You can go through Congress, uh, which I think we could probably reasonably agree Congress is not going to sign on to eliminating the Department of Education, which puts you in a different group. It puts yes. you in the same group as Bush, Obama, Biden, Trump, all people who promised to do things on day one, mm -hmm. do it by executive fiat. They are challenged in the courts or, or by Congress. Doesn't these plans, of which you have a lot, by executive fiat, just make you another one of these presidential candidates who wants to do things by executive order? It's a good question, but I think that there's a fundamental difference between a chief executive who wants to reduce regulations set forth by the executive branch, reduce managerial cancer in the executive bureaucracy versus those who wish to create something they were never authorized to actually create. Very big difference. And so my view is that Article 2 of the Constitution says there is one chief executive of the executive branch. I know this as an outsider. I'm not a politician. I think that's actually an asset in this race and in leading this country. I know that if somebody works for you and you can't fire them, that means they don't work for you. It means you work for them because you're responsible for what they do without having any authority to actually change it. And I refuse to be that puppet sitting in the White House. So, Leland, I will say this. I don't like to boast, but this is just a fact. I think I have the single greatest understanding of how to actually shut down the administrative bureaucratic deep state on legal grounds. I'll give you one example. What stopped Trump from doing it, for example, was they said there are civil service protections that stop you from firing people, for example, at the Department of Education. Well, read the law. Turns out that only applies to individual firings. It does not apply to mass layoffs. Mass layoffs are absolutely what I am bringing to the D.C. bureaucracy. Will I be sued over it? Yes, I will. That means we go to the Supreme Court, which I've studied. We win six to three in the current Supreme Court, and that's how we drive real change, because now it's in judicial precedent, and the next president who comes after me won't have his hands tied in the same way. And so that's how I intend to do this, grounded in principle, okay. grounded in the law, and actually deliver for the people of this country. All right, so let's assume for a moment that you can indeed do that. And I, I think reasonable people could agree that there are some questions and there are legal scholars on the other side of this, and that, that'll be debated by the Supreme Court. What if Joe Biden decided to do exactly the same thing with ICE? If, Would you be okay with that? If Joe Biden wanted to shut down agencies in the federal government and had a constitutional basis for doing it as I do, for example, the Presidential Reorganization Act of 1977 says the president can shut down an agency if it stimulates the economy or if it eliminates redundancies in the federal government. That's the one I'll use to shut down the FBI, by the way. I would absolutely support his so decision. So he says it's going to, to use your first one, that it's going to help the economy. He says we need more immigrants, not less, because we need more workers, not less. I'm going to shut down ICE. Well, we have to still enforce the laws of this country. That's the difference. Well, but the, the Department of Education is also a law. Funding it is also a law by Congress. I'm just, I'm just trying yeah. to figure out where you're cherry-picking which agencies are able to be shut down and which aren't. Reducing bureaucracy is the top of the agenda. And so if you're generally reducing bureaucracy, I stand on the side of doing it. And ICE is a perfect example. ICE isn't doing their job. We have 10 to 14,000 illegal migrants illegally crossing the southern border daily. That is the Swiss cheese of a southern border where fentanyl is flowing across this border in a one-way opium war that we fail to recognize that we're in. Human trafficking, child trafficking. Why? Because you have a bunch of bureaucrats who we never elected. And this is the big joke of our system. People in the Republican Party want me to criticize Joe Biden. I find that boring. Why would I criticize Biden when he's not even the person running the country? The people who we elect to run the government are not the ones who actually run the government. And you know what? I would rather have a Democrat president who I disagreed with 
still, if he was the duly elected president, at least be the one who actually wielded the executive power of this country rather than to actually be a puppet wielding the executive power of the administrative state, which is exactly how it works today. And this is what I tell the rest of the Republican Party. Stop talking about Biden and Harris. Start talking about our own vision, what we stand for. 2022 wasn't a red wave. It was a red trickle at best. Because you can criticize the radical Biden agenda all you want. If you lack a vision of your own, we're going to lose again. But if you want to win in a landslide, as I believe I will as the nominee, we will explain to the people of this country why reducing the federal employee headcount, the size of the federal government, by 75% will stimulate the economy. It'll restore a three-branch constitutional republic, and it will revive the essence of our national soul. Do that. We'll win in a landslide. That's exactly what I'm going to do. I think there's some, there was a joke Ronald Reagan once made about non-essential employees on snow days. <laughs> if, they, if you don't show up on a snow day, you're not needed in the federal government. All right, we're going to get to your issues on the border in a little my, bit. My version of that is if you're working by, by a Zoom, see you later. <laughs> you know, right, well, that'll, that'll clear out a lot too. of offices in D.C. Yeah. Karen Davis, retired Census Bureau worker in New Hampshire, is with us for a question uh, about education as well. Hi. Yes, hi. Thank you, Mr. Ramaswamy. I agree with your uh, proposal uh, to have uh, civics, uh, uh, high school students have to know their civics uh, and then pass the test that um, new uh, citizens have to take. Uh, but if there was no federal Department of Education, how would that be enforced as uh, in your administration? As my understanding that education is set at the state and local level. So how your would it be? Your understanding is absolutely correct, and I intend to keep it that way. So even though many of the solutions that I speak to stand for my vision for this country, I'm going to depend on states, good governors, good mayors, good school board members to do their part. It's really important to preserve that federal separation in our system of federalism in this country. I'm a Tenth Amendment absolutist. That which is not reserved to the federal government is respectively reserved to the states and to the people. So I will abide by that. Right. I have expressed my support for a constitutional amendment in this country that says that basically if you want to age into citizenship, including all the civic privileges, including voting, you have to at least pass that same civics test that an immigrant has to pass in order to become a voting citizen, or else at least serve this country minimally for six months in the military or a first responder role. So that constitutional amendment is something that I can drive as the U.S. president. But you're absolutely right. It will indeed take school board members, governors, local parents really driving that change at the state and local level, which is where education belongs. All right, so now that we are in the realm of amending the Constitution, uh, term limits? I favor term limits. Okay, Three for Congress, two for the U.S. Senate. I do have to say something, Leland, though. This is the less important term limit that matters. The real term limit that we need, we have an eight-year term limit in the executive branch for the U.S. president that I can't collect a paycheck from you all as the taxpayers for more than eight years, which I think is a good thing. But then neither should any of those federal employees reporting into me either. Term limits for the bureaucracy of people who were never elected in the first place. And that I can do without a constitutional amendment because I will be the CEO of the executive branch, including the HR department, which reports into me. That's change we can drive starting in year one. You, you have suggested, as part of your constitutional amendment vis-a-vis -vis voting rights, that if someone doesn't pass this civics test, it would require them to serve for six months in the military or in a first responder role. If they want to vote. If they want to vote. If they don't want to vote, you can be up until 25, no matter how ignorant you are of America, you get to vote. Yeah, so the, the basic proposal is... We want everybody in this country to have skin in the game. That's what our founding fathers envisioned. They, for back then, it was land ownership. That's not right for our era. Skin in the game now means you know something about the country. Not something that I'm making up. It's the things that we already require. Immigrants, people like my mother, or countless immigrants, potentially even in this room, to have known before you became voting citizens of this country. I think it's very reasonable. Tests aren't for everyone. Service can be a good way to avoid that, too. But that's the kind of civic revival we're going to need. Did this policy poll well on day one? No, it did not. But I still, over the wishes of my campaign advisors and otherwise, said, no, this is important. And I believe as Reagan did, right? What did Reagan do when his vision for this country didn't poll well? He said, well, I haven't done a good enough job of persuading the people of this country. 
That's the kind of spirit we need because we live in a moment where national pride is on the decline. Less than 16% of Gen Z says they're proud to be American. 60% of young Americans, I'm not making this up, 60% according to the Reboot Foundation in a recent survey, 60% said they would sooner give up their right to vote than to give up their access to TikTok. Okay, this is a national crisis. We're not gonna find our way out of it automatically. And there's an old saying that goes, you know, if you care about somebody, you tell them the truth. If you care about yourself, you tell them what they wanna hear. Well, I care about the people of this country. That is why I will tell them the truth. I believe that will be the successful political strategy, but either way, that's the way we're running this campaign. All right. Uh, speaking of the truth, this has been a thorny issue for Republicans, the issue of abortion. I know you have some strong thoughts on it. Keith Brin from the Chicago suburbs, he's an attorney uh, as well, to ask about abortion. Thank you for taking my question. Republicans have not fared well in elections since the Dobb decision came out. How will you convince independent voters to vote for you on questions of abortion without alienating the pro-life Republican base? Well, look, I think we're, I can start with the latter part of that because that's the easier part. I am part of the pro-life Republican base. I am unapologetically pro-life. I picked it up during my years at St. X High School in Cincinnati, and I've remained persuaded of it ever since. The good news is I actually think most Americans share pro-life instincts, and I can prove that to you. Just take the case that Clarence Thomas asked about during the Dobbs hearing. Pregnant woman walking down the street, she's assaulted. Unborn child dies as a result. You find me one American, one person even in this room today, who says that that criminal does not deserve liability for that death. You won't find one, at least I haven't yet. That says we share the same intuitions in common. Now we've turned it into men's rights versus women's rights. I think this is about human rights. So I, for my part, am willing to walk the walk when it comes to being pro-life. And here's where I'm different from many Republicans. I think we should be open to policies to help support contraception, adoption, paths to childcare, sexual responsibility for men, in an era of genetic paternity tests that are 100% reliable. Add that to the law in terms of liabilities and responsibilities that men should bear too, to say we're all in this together. This is not a men's versus women's issue, it's a human rights issue. And then I'll also say this, I'm running for US president, I'm not running for governor. As I said earlier, I'm a 10th Amendment absolutist. That which is not reserved to the federal government is reserved respectively to the states and to the people. This is a state's first issue. And I am yet to be persuaded of a constitutional justification for the federal government to act. Not Biden to codify Roe versus Wade into law, but in fairness, not Republicans either to codify a different vision into the federal law either. And I think that is how we move forward without letting us be held hostage at behest of national division over this one issue. Will I unite America on this issue? No, this is one issue where I'm never gonna promise to unite us on this one issue. But I can unite this country despite this issue by speaking about it and standing for pro-life commitments in a way that are authentic, in a way that I don't think we in the pro-life movement have yet completely done. Keith, you're from Highland Park, uh, which is a, a fairly liberal part of a fairly liberal state. Yeah. Does that answer change any minds, you think? No, yeah. uh, it, it doesn't. It's, and I know that, and I know that. But it's a hard sell. But here's my mission. I'm not, I'm, I'm not looking to change someone's mind on where they are on abortion, but I am up to change somebody's mind on this. We can still be one nation, even as we deeply disagree on our most firmly held convictions. And if somebody tells me that we can't, well, then I'm going to persuade those people and bring them along. And so nothing in my response was in the 60 seconds that we had designed to convince someone to change their mind on the abortion issue. But what I stand for firmly as the next president of the United States is that we will not let this issue or any one issue divide us to a national breaking point. And that does take talking about and leading on this issue in a way that's a little bit different than traditional Republicans have. All right, so you're laying this out almost as a messaging problem for Republicans, I think right? it's a policy issue too, though. Okay, I, I think well, sexual responsibility for men, that's policy. Okay, that, 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 adoption, is, that is that's policy. policy. That is policy. Yep. But since Dobbs, okay, yep. at the state level that you point out, pro-life ballot initiatives have lost overwhelmingly. Mm -hmm. None of the pro-life right. issues have won. In your home state of Ohio uh, last week in an off-off year special election essentially with a yep. ballot initiative, the pro-life issue lost 57-43. Yes. All right, How? what is the problem then for Republicans on this? If you were saying that you can convince Republicans that you're right and 
at all and swing voters that you're right. Why does this issue keep being a ball and chain around Republicans? Look, my view is this issue was properly settled when Dobbs overturned Roe. That is the correct constitutional decision. This is now an issue left to the states. Well, I went to you... Iowa for, for when they signed their six-week legislation right. into law. I made it a point to be there because that was a victory for federalism. People were elected by wider and wider margins to the state legislature saying exactly what they were going to do, and then they did it. And in certain other states, other measures have been defeated. That is federalism. That is what our founding fathers envisioned. And so am I disappointed in that outcome in Ohio? Of course I am, as a citizen. But as somebody who is looking to lead this country as U.S. president, I will have to admit that that is the way federalism works. That is how the way diversity amongst states so, works. So I just want to yep. button this up. Absolutely no federal involvement in abortion policy, including the Hyde Amendment. That's correct. I think that the federal Repeal government... Repeal the Hyde Amendment. Now, now I'm, going to say, I'm, going to say one, I'm going to say one thing about this. In terms of signing a federal ban, here's what I will say, though. Federal funding for Planned Parenthood? Forget about it. Forget about it. I mean, this is use of taxpayer dollars to come down on one side of a politically contentious issue where there is no, for example, constitutional basis for the federal government to be allocating those funds. So I will have pro-life policies that I implement as U.S. president, but it will be from the context of what the federal government is actually constitutionally authorized to do, like cutting funding for Planned Parenthood, which it had no business funding in the first place. But that is different than either codifying Roe versus Wade or signing a federal abortion ban. And I think you understand the difference. Huge difference in in every way. All right. Thank you very much. When we come back, Donald Trump, Hunter Biden, and the law. Plus, can the president of the United States really order the military to seal the southern border? To the border on immigration, we come back. Yes. Well, since time began, or at least elections began, the economy has been issue number one for voters. We want to turn now to a question here in Chicago. Leon Blackshaw, who is a tech worker here in Illinois. Leon? Good evening, Mr. Ramaswamy. Uh, Thank you for joining us here in Chicago. Uh, My question is, what would be your top three priorities for the economy if elected? Well, first, let's see what's wrong with our economy now. In a nutshell, here it is. Prices have gone up. Wages have not. Businesses, both big and small, cannot find people to actually staff open positions. We have over twice as many job openings as we do people looking for work. This is the problem in the economy. How do we fix it? First is fix inflation. Drill, frack, burn coal, embrace nuclear energy. That's how we drive inflation down. That's how we drive GDP growth. No longer pay people to stay at home rather than to go to work. Attach work requirements to welfare. That's how we bring down the national debt. It's also how we help address the open positions in the economy. And I also think that we need radical reform of the U.S. Federal Reserve. What does that mean? Restore dollar stability. Peg the dollar to gold, silver, nickel, and agricultural and farm commodities to stabilize the dollar. That's how we'll see, actually, real wage growth rise in this country. With that, we're back to 5 plus percent GDP growth. You know what? We're going to have a more united country when we're all making more money in that country. That much I'll be able to deliver by, I think, the end of my first 18 months in office. You believe it? I will when I see it. Yeah. You'll see it by 2026. (laughs) That's the answer. Uh, Leon, I, I want to figure out where your question's coming from. What have you been experiencing in Illinois, granted a a democratically run state with a huge debt problem of its own, in the economy that makes this so important to you? Well, I must definitely feel that uh, myself and everyone around me is experiencing, uh, as you mentioned, inflation. So across the board, whether it be the price of food, utilities, uh, real estate, so it's a real problem for, for everyone. So. And it's, it's, it's great you bring that up because there's this narrative now that inflation rates are coming down. Mm-hmm. Don't be fooled, and I suspect you won't be because you experience the prices when you go to the grocery store, when you're actually trying to change your lifestyle to match your actual budget because inflation is cumulative. So here's the hard truth. 
Prices today are still 16% higher than when Biden first took office, yet wage growth is far more stagnant. So when wages stay flat and prices go up, people suffer as a consequence. That's where we are today. And I think that the unemployment number being low is also a false mirage because the real problem is the reverse. Businesses, both small and large, cannot find enough workers to actually drive their growth. These are structural failures in the economy. And so we have to actually understand what's going on. Believe me, that's not going to take a professional politician to get that job done. Maybe somebody who has actually built multi-billion dollar companies in the private sector who has executive experience, that's exactly what it's going to take to see this through. You, you said there's a hard truth. Your other, the other hard truth is that we have an exploding national debt. Yes, we do. And, and we are at a point where it pretty clearly, within the next couple of years, there's a possibility, if interest rates stay where they are, that the interest on the national debt is going to be more than the tax receipts of the U.S. government. The only way to fix that is entitlement reform, Medicare, Social Security, possibly Medicaid reform. Are you up for that? I am up for that after we have delivered economic growth. We're starting from a place of deep distrust right now, and for good reason. So the first step we need to take is actually deliver GDP growth. I can get us back to four, I think, five-plus percent GDP growth compared to one-point-something percent now. After that, people have more money in their pockets. Then we can have the conversation about how for the next generation, not touching the benefits okay. of seniors now, but Fair for enough. the next generation, how we rationalize by first taking aim at the bureaucracy. Those are the easiest savings we can derive, plus work requirements for welfare. That gives us a big head start. All right. You have made an incredible career for yourself by, by being an excellent, excellent, among other things, salesman. Hmm. And, and with confidence in yourself and confidence in your ability to get things done. I want to read from you, uh, for you a quote from the New York Times. Obviously, it's the New York Times, but you'll know where <laughs> we're going. Uh, Mr. Ramaswamy's enterprise, uh, meaning your first, your first business, is best known for a spectacular failure. As a 29-year-old with a bold idea and Ivy League connections, he engineered what was at the time the largest initial public offering in the biotechnology industry's history, only to see the Alzheimer drug at the center fail two years later and the company's value tank. But Mr. Ramaswamy, now 37, made a fortune anyway. Well, yeah, I can address that. I know, I know you can, but let me just dot, dot, dot. You, you sold investors on, on the Alzheimer's drug, and you're selling people here that you can achieve 5% GDP growth. What did you learn from yep. past failures that make you your current promises more believable? Well, it's a great question. And believe me, I think that failure is part of what makes every entrepreneur stronger. 99.7% of drugs ever tested for Alzheimer's disease have failed by big pharma and small. My drug for Alzheimer's was not an exception on that. However, here's how I did achieve my success. That built the foundation for developing five FDA-approved medicines, one in life-saving therapy in kids, another for prostate cancer, for endometriosis, uterine fibroids, psoriasis, and all in my seven years as a biotech CEO. So what did I learn from that? Hardship is not a choice. Hardship is something that happens to you. Victimhood is a choice. And we choose not to be victims. We choose to be victorious. I think that is a lesson for America where we find ourselves now. We are a nation in hardship. But we should not choose to cower in that hardship. That can make us stronger. My company would have never been as strong as it was had we not gone through the experience of developing that drug for Alzheimer's disease. And it was many of those same people that helped deliver life-saving medicines and life-changing medicines for other diseases. That is actually what this American story is all about. And you know what? Capitalism, it is the best system known to man to lift people up from poverty. My father was facing layoffs under Jack Welch's tenure at GE, had to go to law school at night to help us make the ends meet at home. Here I am a single generation later building multi-billion dollar companies by developing life-saving medicines and, by the way, building a separate successful you... asset management firm. That's the American dream that I want to show every kid in this country is possible. That's also, by the way, how we'll get back to 5-plus percent GDP growth. Your dad going to night school for law school yeah. had a big impression on you, didn't it? It did, actually. It showed me that, you know what? You don't complain about the hardships that you face. You find ways to deal with it. My mom, on certain nights, would take my brother and I to go play the piano in the nursing homes where she was treating patients with Alzheimer's disease. Uh -huh. She was a geriatric psychiatrist. That had an influence on me. 
In fact, if there's something I do when I'm when I leave the presidency in 2033, I'll be 48 years old, something like this. Well, you know what? One of the things I still want to come back to doing, if it's nobody else has figured out in the meantime, is see if we can't deliver a treatment, dare I say, a cure for Alzheimer's disease. That is what we do as Americans. We are the pioneers. We are the explorers. Nobody stops us from realizing our maximal potential, the greatest positive impact we can have. For me, it's just that the next step that has to be through reviving the national soul right. that comes through the presidency. Speaking of hardship, a uh, few people in America, I mean, obviously we were dealing with what's going on in Hawaii right now with the wildfires, uh, 100 dead, possibly more, uh, it's getting an enormous amount of national media attention, something that did not necessarily get a lot of national media attention, aside from here on News Nation, is the disaster in East Palestine, Ohio, your, mm -hmm. your home state. Hillary Flint lives near the disaster site where the train derailed and spilled millions of gallons of toxic chemicals and is with us uh, in studio tonight. Thank you. So over six months ago, a train derailed less than five miles from my house in Eden Valley, Pennsylvania. I then self-evacuated about 20 miles into Beaver County, and that same evening, the Shell Plastics plant flared and exposed, it, exposed me, a cancer survivor, to even more carcinogens. Now those same companies that have poisoned myself, my community, my home, are in charge of taking care of us. They're in charge of the health and safety of thousands of people within Pennsylvania and Ohio. So my question for you is, as a multimillionaire, how are you going to protect everyday Americans like me from billion dollar companies? Well, look, I think that I'm aiming to do it as your next president. But it's interesting you did bring up my financial success. When that happened in East Palestine, I didn't know what to do. I wish when people say, do you want to go there and visit? What am I going to do by showing up? That's not going to change anything. Actually, I don't think I've talked about this publicly before, but my family made a $100,000 donation to the recovery efforts just because that was the least we could do for our own home state. And yet we feel, still felt like we were struggling against the backdrop of a failing infrastructure. We have a failed Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg, who will wax eloquent about climate change without even taking the time to visit or even acknowledge the actual catastrophe until it cost him political points. The reality is even now in Maui, our fellow Hawaiians, our fellow citizens, are left to fend for themselves as the U.S. government sends $200 billion to protect somebody else's border from an invasion when we have problems right here at home. We're doing more for Ukrainian infrastructure than we are for U.S. infrastructure in this country. So a big part of what I've said is we're going to put the interests of Americans first. We're not going to build infrastructure in Ukraine. We're not going to pay the deep state in Ukraine. Our own taxpayer dollars are going to pay them. Let's actually rebuild the infrastructure in this country with those same dollars, not with tax increases, but with better uses of the dollars that we're using to nation build somewhere else. We talk a lot about nation building. We have a nation to rebuild right here back at home. That's what I stand for. And by the way, as it relates to those railroad companies and otherwise, end of the crony capitalism and corruption. Many of them are waxing eloquent about ESG and climate change. How about just taking care of the communities that you're actually running through? And when you've taken care of central Ohio and western Pennsylvania, then talk to me about what you're doing for global climate change in the eastern hemisphere. Until then, take care of your job here at home to the communities that you're affecting. All right. I'm going to follow up on that for you. The, there's a few things there. We'll get to Ukraine in a second. But just quickly, you're proposing to gut a number of the three-letter agencies That's that right. are, whose job it is is to protect East Palestine. You know what I'm proposing? I'm proposing to gut them precisely because they haven't been protecting places uh, like fair, East Palestine. Fair, fair enough. These that bureaucracies said... have failed repeatedly. And you know what? If somebody broke the keys to your, if somebody broke your car, you don't turn over the keys to the guy who broke well, it. Well, then who's okay? going to do it? Well, I think actually I would just take that money. Here's a general blueprint for how I'll run the federal government, from health care to education policy, even to other areas of the federal government. Take those savings and put that money back in the pockets of our citizens. Just send them a tax-free check if that's what it takes. Everyone in this country will be strictly better off than to feed the beast of our Leviathan and bureaucracy in the meantime. That's exactly how we drive change. All right, we're an hour in. You've gotten to a word that I don't know, the Leviathan? Yes, the Leviathan is Thomas Hobbes' word 400 years ago for the monster, the beast. The Leviathan today is those three-letter monstrous agencies that really quash the will of everyday citizens, all right? 
This is what Thomas Hobbes envisioned 400 years ago. That's what gave inspiration to our founding fathers to write a constitution that says, you know what? We, the people, create a government that is accountable to us, not the other way around. That is the American way. And you know what, Leland? Mm -hmm. Some people call me extreme at times. Guilty as charged. All because right. the American ideals that founded this country, they are extreme ideals. No, For most no, of human history, it was done the, the other way. The most radical idea that's ever, that's ever been tried. Exactly. So let's embrace you, that radicalism and shut down those government agencies. One part of America that has also been radical is our willingness to help our allies abroad. World War I, World War II, we were attacked, but then we went to war uh, as well. Uh, we went to war when Pearl Harbor was bombed. Right. And, and yes, and if you World mess War with us on our homeland, we will come for you and right. you will have hell to pay for it. World War I, we also got it. We also went into NATO, okay, and agreed to protect our allies. It's something that America has done that's unique to America to spread not our, and expand our own territory, but to expand, spend, expand freedom. You've drawn a direct parallel between aid to East Palestine, aid to, aid to Ukraine, and what we're doing yes. in Ukraine. That is unique pretty much not only in the Republican field, but in the presidential field yes. uh, as well. Is your comments not simply emboldening someone who has a large nuclear arsenal and has publicly stated his goals are to take over more land and potentially attack U.S. allies? The answer to that question is no. Here's how I actually define peace in Ukraine. We will do a deal. In a good deal, everybody has to get something out of the deal. I'll start with what Putin gets out of the deal. We will freeze the current lines of control, just like we did at the end of the Korean War. We will further make a commitment that NATO will not admit Ukraine to NATO. Remember, James Baker told Gorbachev in 1990 that we would not have NATO expand one inch beyond Germany. Well, look what we've done since then. In return, though, I will require that Vladimir Putin exit his military partnership with China. The Russia-China military partnership outmatches the United States on nuclear capabilities, on hypersonic missiles, on China's naval capacities, all the while a country in China that we depend on for our modern way of life. And worst of all, through the Ukraine war, we're actually pushing Russia further into China's hands. So I will end that war on terms that advance American interests. This is also you, how well, we... You just, you just said you'd make a deal with Vladimir Putin. Yes, I Has would. Has Vladimir Putin ever made a deal that he's lived up to? Because we haven't actually backstopped it with the proper self-interest. I don't trust Vladimir Putin, but I trust him to follow his self-interest. And if we've reopened economic relations with Russia, if we have actually made a hard commitment that NATO will not admit Ukraine to NATO, he will have no reason to be in that military partnership with China. He doesn't enjoy being Xi Jinping's little brother. He wants to actually have a trilateral world order, not a bilateral one that favors China where he's the little stepson. So the reality is, I can trust him to follow his self-interest. By the way, just like Nixon did for Mao Zedong in 1972. All right. I'm speaking at the Nixon Library later this week, laying out this is a reverse <clears throat> Nixon maneuver. We didn't trust Mao, but we trusted him to follow his self-interest. We shouldn't trust Putin, but we can trust him to follow his self-interest, and he can trust us to follow ours. And that's why I think I will be more effective in leading this country if I'm honest with the rest of the world as I will be with all of you, that I stand unapologetically for America's interests. You know what? That may sound bad to some people on the global stage, but they know they can believe it. They know it's honest. That's exactly how you can make deals if you're you, doing you, it based on honest terms. You, you have certainly shown an ability to speak your mind during yeah. the campaign and be, be clear and be bold. Some of your other bold suggestions are about the border. Corey Howard has been impacted by the southern border crisis that is 1,200 miles away from where we are here uh, in Chicago. I would say probably a couple of years ago, Corey, you never thought you'd be talking about the border. Is something coming here to you? No, I didn't, sir. Good evening, uh, Vivek Ramaswamy. I live in the Woodlawn neighborhood in Chicago, where an elementary school closed by the city years ago is now being used to house migrants. The community has experienced migrants' assaults vandalism of personal property, and the police seem unwilling to deal with this concern. You have commented to use the U.S. military on the border to curb this. How will you respond if Congress is opposed to this course of action? Which high school or which school? Wadsworth Elementary. Wadsworth, okay. So I visited South Shore High School, also here in Chicago. The same thing's happening over there. 
By the way, I went to the south side of Chicago, what, just a couple of months ago. It's not a very popular stop on the Republican campaign trail, I'll say, but I'm glad I went there because people in that community are asking the same question that I'd be asking in their shoes and I am asking now. Why are illegal migrants who break the law to come here being housed at a high school at the cost of $7,000 per migrant per month when we're not doing very much for that community right here at home? So yes, I believe the wall has been insufficient. I do think we need to finish building the wall, but it's not enough. They're building cartel-financed tunnels underneath that wall, bringing fentanyl, illegal migrants, criminals into this country daily by the thousands. So yes, I've said that I will use the military to protect not an invasion across somebody else's border halfway around the world, but to protect against the invasion, increasingly even the armed invasion, cartel gunmen included, across our own southern border. Right. I believe I will do this as the commander in chief without asking Congress either for permission or for forgiveness because I'm the commander in chief and I will station our troops not in places by the tens of thousands like we have in Germany today or in other parts of the world where they're not really doing much of great use. And the young men and women in our military, they will and should be proud of protecting our nation right here at home. That's my modern foreign policy, a modern Monroe Doctrine which says that you do not mess with the United States of America on our own home turf or in the Western Hemisphere. And if you do, and China is doing it, it's Chinese-made fentanyl through the synthetic materials that the drug cartels are using to make fentanyl that they're pumping across our southern border. No, you don't mess with us here. We will defend. And I think our national defense has been skewed for the last 20 years, going and playing offense, fighting somebody else's war. Under my watch, our national defense spending will once again go towards defense of the homeland, protecting our citizens right here at home. Corey, I see you smiling. Do you think a Republican has a chance on the south side of Chicago? I think a lot of constituents in Chicago would welcome a different course of action, sir. Yeah. I, you got a haircut down there, didn't you? I did get a haircut yeah, down there. I kind of need one again. Maybe I should go down there if I was here a little longer. It's right. a good haircut they gave me. All right, Corey, thank you very much. Still ahead, Mr. Ramaswamy weighs in on the Trump indictments, the breaking news from earlier, and the Hunter Biden investigation. We'll see you in a minute. Welcome back. We told you earlier, a grand jury has indicted President Trump for the grand jury, sorry, the grand jury did not vote against any of the Trump indictment presented tonight by the Fulton County Grand Jury. Fannie Wills, we're still waiting for the actual indictment to be made public and find out exactly who is named and what the charges are. But there is an expectation the former president is one of those named in the indictments. Mr. Ramaswamy, as president, you will have some cho tough choices to make, which brings us to our next question from Carolyn Morell, retired office manager in New Hampshire, and she has a question about the previous federal indictments against the former president. Uh, good evening. You said as president, if Trump was convicted, that you would pardon him. In doing so, how would you expect to work with Congress that is so divided already? Look, I think that we have a major task ahead of us in reuniting this country. And I thank you for highlighting that major issue. One of the main reasons why I think it's really important to me that we actually do pardon Donald Trump, who is an opponent of mine in this election. I think I'm going out of my way to say it precisely because he is an opponent. We have to stand on the side of principle. We have to move forward as a country. I think if we remain a nation where whoever's in power is using police force against its political rivals, that's a dangerous downward slide for a nation. And I think that Congress, that's probably going to be one of the last places we see national unity. But I think where we're going to see national unity first is bubble up from we the people. I, I would venture to say, I've been to Manchester, New Hampshire many times. I love visiting you guys in the Granite State. If you think about your neighbors or your colleagues or your classmates, I think most of them believe in the same values that this nation was founded on free speech, self-governance, meritocracy. I think you believe that most of them do too, but you can't be sure anymore because we don't feel free to talk about it. So once we're able to start talking openly, we will realize that this country is far more united than the media or social media will have us believe. 
I think at the top, it takes a president who says, we're done with the bickering. We're done with the weaponization of police power. We're moving forward as one nation. And once the president's able to do that, we set a national tone where I have full faith in the people of this country to take care of the rest. All right. Carolyn, you think he's up to it? Pardon me? <laughs> <laughs> I think we were having a little bit of an issue communicating with you um, in New Hampshire. But let's sort of unpack what this would involve of partnering Donald Trump. Obviously, the Georgia stuff is outside yes. the realm of, of what a president uh, could do. But you've been all over the map, really, about, about Donald Trump. And I know in the past, uh, you sort of blew I don't up think the so, actually. Yeah. OK, well, well, we'll see. Uh, you've said that the, this passage I'm about to read from your book, you were, you were joking. I've read it. Didn't sound like you were, you were joking. I didn't so, say any of these things, so but that's OK. Keep it going. was a dark day for democracy. I'm reading the passage yeah. from your book talking about January 6th. The loser of the last election refused to concede the race, claimed the election was stolen, raised hundreds of millions of dollars from loyal supporters, and considering running for executive office again, I am referring, of course, to Donald Trump. How is that someone who you can still say is a man who you would respect and believe is an advisor and a man of honor and commitment to the America that you say is so important from 1776. Yeah, so first of all, that passage from the book was an identical quote where the, Donald Trump was actually filled in for Stacey Abrams, and we juxtaposed the two paragraphs. But put that to one side, that doesn't matter. The real point is, we're all human beings. Okay, we're not a nation of gods, we're not governed by gods. We're governed by flawed human beings. All of us are flawed human beings. But a bad judgment is not the same thing as a crime. Would I have made different judgments than Donald Trump made? Absolutely, I would have. I will remind you that I'm running for U.S. president to lead our nation forward because I believe I am the best positioned individual in this race to do it. But I think separately, it is a bad precedent that we set when we try to lock up those political opponents. That's bad for the country. And it's my view that, yes, Donald Trump was a successful president at least made progress on the border crisis. The first president to recognize openly in either major political party the threats posed by China. I think his defeat of Hillary Clinton was probably the most important political milestone of the 21st century, possibly in my lifetime. We did not have a major war. We were not marching towards a major war, as we are potentially now. We were potentially on the brink of one for North Korea at the time that Barack Obama left us with that mess. And so, yes, I judge a president by the results. Does that mean he's perfect? Of course he's not. And I think there are areas to improve. But that is a very different statement than saying that he should be prosecuted for a okay. wide array of crimes, so, which I think is not good for this country. And so, yes, I stand on the side of principle. All right. So political prosecutions, not good for the country. Day one, you're going to pardon Donald Trump. I will. OK. Reasonable people could probably agree that if Hunter Biden was Hunter Smith, he would not be being charged with these two tax charges and certainly not being charged on the gun charge and certainly wouldn't have a special prosecutor looking into him. I'm going to just stop you right there on this one point. I don't think that that's what reasonable people would say. I think reasonable people would say that this guy who's underqualified even to hold a job at a local fast food chain is somehow earning millions of dollars sitting on the board of a Ukrainian energy company with no expertise in the energy sector and using him trading on his father's name to enrich his family, the same country that is now getting $200 billion of taxpayer oh. aid when that same father's president. So I think that's what so if, if reasonable we are to bring, people would say. If we say. are to bring all true, and I, yeah. I would agree with that, if we are to bring America together on day one, if you're going to pardon Donald Trump and principle is more important and bringing America together is more important, why wouldn't you also pardon Hunter Biden? Well, here's my view on this, and I've been very clear on this. There can be no reconciliation without truth. That Hunter Biden laptop story with a lot of those bribes was censored systematically on the eve of the 2020 election. That is wrong. That is a stain on our national history. Now we have a U.S. president that is inexplicably providing hundreds of billions of dollars to our money to the very nation whose state-affiliated company bribed that president's family member, his own son. So we have to get to the bottom of it. I support that. But here's what else what I, what I will say, Leland, is that as U.S. president, when I get to January 21st, 2025, my second day in office, after I've pardoned Donald Trump, after I've pardoned many of the other victims of politically motivated persecutions through prosecution, after we've won in a landslide election, are on our path to reunite this country and lead this nation forward. 
am I going to be focused on the Biden family? Or am I going to be focused on American families throughout this country? I choose focus on American families. Okay, well, and so well, that's going to be so, my agenda, uh, not pursuing a politicized prosecution either. And that's where I stand so on the side of principle. You say, when, when you say, though, not focused, does that mean you tell your attorney general, we're done, let's move on? Or does that mean that if the attorney general wants to investigate... Uh, I think we need to get to the facts. I think we need to get to the facts. There can be no reconciliation without truth. The view of the police state. Well, how are today we going to how are we going to get to the facts if it's not your priority? Well, we have to get, we have to ultimately. I do support an impeachment inquiry on Biden for these charges, especially as it relates to the funds being sent to Ukraine now, which are a repayment of a bribe. I do support vigorous investigation into Hunter Biden's dealings. We cannot have a government where foreign adversaries are buying and effectively paying for policies from our U.S. presidents as puppets. That's unacceptable. So I do support the investigations in getting to the bottom of the truth. But why are we even having a conversation about pardons when there hasn't even been an indictment of Hunter Biden, when there have been three so to you, four now against Donald Trump? So, so that's the real question. This will get us to the lightning round, and I will start right there. So I'll say a phrase, words, whatever, give me Good. a quick answer. First thing, it sounds a little bit like you think Trump would be convicted if you'd say you'd pardon him. I don't necessarily know that. That's going to be up to the jury. Okay. But if he is convicted of these politicized prosecutions in the interest of moving this country forward, yes, I will pardon him. All right. So... Future answers even shorter. Okay. All right, here we go. Lightning round. Uh, Vladimir Putin. First words that come to your mind. He can follow, we can trust him to follow his self-interest, but he is not a friend to this nation. Zelensky. Fraud. <laughs> direct? That's the most direct answer you've given all night. All right. short. There we go. All right, you have two sons. Daughter's name if you had one. Mm. I we haven't really thought about that, actually. Maybe Lakshmi. All right. Does that have some certain meaning to you? It does, yeah. She's, she's uh, in, in our faith, a symbol and goddess of prosperity. All right. Say something nice about President Joe Biden. I think he loves his son. And, I, and, I, and that, I'm not saying that lightly. I think he's a father who loves his son. And that small element of a deeply flawed man, I can still respect that. All right. Do you think he is at least trying hard or just trying for himself? I think he is barely capable in making decisions as a human being at his age. It's a form of elder abuse, what they're really putting him through. It's really the managerial class pulling the strings of their puppet. Joe Biden's just a puppet. All right. Georgia Maloney, prime minister of Italy. Strong, good, like her, met her, gave her a copy of Woke Inc. I hope she read it. <laughs> Did you hear back from her after you gave it to her? I can't remember, actually. Uh, yeah, she, both of us have been kind of busy. <laughs> but I support a leader who stands for the national identity of her nation. What we're missing in this country is a national leader who stands for the identity of our nation. That's what I'm bringing to the table. All right, you are from Cincinnati. I am from St. Louis. We are in Chicago. I'm sure there's some jokes to be made about the Cardinals, the Reds, and the, and the Cubs, but I'll, I'll refrain just for a minute. Favorite flavor of Grater's ice cream? Ah, uh, I like, well, that's a pretty good one. Cookies and cream is pretty good. Cookies and cream, any, yeah. that's ba basic, not, not black chip raspberry. Sometimes you gotta start with the fundamentals. All right, all right, there we go. Uh, what is more likely, Bengals going back to the Super Bowl or the Reds to win the World Series? Oh, I, you know, I like uh, the Bengals going back to the Super Bowl. Unfinished business. And so my whole life, I was, had a dream the Bengals were going to win the Super Bowl. When they finally made it, I said, we're going to go all the way to L.A. and watch it. They ended up losing on the final drive. So I still have hope. All right. Well, hope is a nice place to end yeah. this town hall. It's something you're trying to provide, America. I know, as a reminder, at the start of the evening, we asked how many of you were undecided on who you would support in the Republican primary. So, once again, by a show of hands, who here, and we'll include our audiences in Des Moines and Manchester, is more likely to vote for Mr. Ramaswamy? All right, what about Manchester? Okay, we're gonna try to zoom in here. It looks about half in Manchester, well, third in Manchester, uh, Des Moines, Iowa, who's more likely after hearing Mr. Ramaswamy? All right, half there, and then we got about two-thirds here uh, in Chicago. We'd like to thank our audience uh, here in Chicago. You all have been great. Des Moines, Manchester, thank you. You all will be caucusing and voting here in the next five or six months. At home, the conversation is just beginning on social media. Use the hashtag TheVakeTownHall. And with that, we thank you, Mr. Ramaswamy. This has been excellent. Thank you. It was thank an you honor. very much. Thank Pleasure. you for having me, and thank you all for the honor. We'll thank you. You got the
We'll see you out on the campaign trail. Thank you. Thank you very much. It. My friend Chris Cuomo is standing by to critique both of us, I <laughs> think. That's what the post game is for. Hopefully more of you. We'll, <laughs> I'm, just I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> There's a lot to critique. We'll turn it over to him. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thank you for watching. Please go to NewsNationNow.com, NewsNationNow.com, and you can find NewsNation on your television provider. And don't forget to click the red subscribe button down below. Then you will get more of NewsNation's fact-driven coverage.